Jeff, one of the most powerful ways that uh, atheists would attack religion is to use evolutionary psychology to show that some of the things that people used to assume was required by religion and by a divine creation, such as morality or human uniqueness, uh, can be in fact explained through the evolutionary process. Do you think that evolutionary psychology undermines religion? Mary Midgley uh, has this funny comment. She says, in recent years, we've seen the breakdown of a precarious truce between uh, human scientists and evolutionary biologists, where previously hu um, human scientists had agreed not to question the truth of evolutionary theory so long as nobody attempted to make any serious use of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, just in the last several decades, um, we've seen an explosion of work uh, into morality, uh, the question of human uniqueness, the evolution of religious cognition uh, from evolutionary biology as a result of the development of new, new uh, empirical tools, but also theoretical approaches. And I think um, it does raise questions in, in all these areas, uh, theologically salient questions. I think some of the, the, uh, the deliverances are potentially challenging, and some of them are potentially confirming or at least concordant with traditional religious belief. Okay, let's understand yeah. each of those categories. So, um, so let's take uh, one area, partic uh, evolutionary accounts of religious cognition. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there are several challenges that, uh, that critics of religion say these approaches raise, and, and actually the challenges depend on uh, which particular theory uh, you're, you're looking at. So uh, one of the theories, uh, the dominant theories, is the byproduct or spandrel theory that says that um, uh, our dispositions toward belief in supernatural agents uh, uh, is innate. It's not just a cultural overlay, but it's not an adaptation. Uh, it's an, uh, a byproduct. Evolutionists call it a, a spandrel of other cognitive dispositions that are um, that are adaptations. So the Yale psychologist Paul Bloom had an article in the Atlantic a while ago called "Is God an Accident?" and he says that belief in God is the uh, uh, the result of a byproduct gone awry. Mm -hmm. Now um, the the problem there, the reason I don't think that uh, works is um, is demonstrating the awryness of the byproduct. So the fact that something has not been the target of natural selection uh, doesn't have anything to say about its, uh, whether it's, if it's a cognitive disposition, doesn't have anything to say uh, necessarily about uh, its uh, fidelity to truth. So for example, the capacity to do higher mathematics in the view of many biologists may be a byproduct, but that, that doesn't make the deliverances of mathematics questionable. And on the other hand, by the way, some defenders of, of um, religion want to say... But there'd be a difference between mathematics, uh, which certainly would be a byproduct of evolution, and, and uh, a, a tendency or a sense to believe in God, because if there is a God, then God has will and intention, and God would have m made a, an intentional effort to make that happen or not, whereas mathematics is, uh, is inert, at least from a causative point of view. Yeah, and actually, from that point of view, might, you might even say if you uh, start with uh, uh, the assumption of theism, there's greater warrant to believe that these cognitive dispositions do be deliver beliefs that are warranted. But uh, my only point uh, my, was that the cognitive dispositions that are not adaptations, um, there's no epistemic uh, reason to, to question their veracity. And on the other hand, um, cognitive dispositions that are adaptive may have systematic biases that deviate from truth. So there's a, a fair amount of work for the placebo effect or the generation of overconfidence in certain uh, situations of conflict. So my response to this first objection that byproducts uh, deliver uh, beliefs that are um, unwarranted is that the adaptive or non-adaptive status of a cognitive disposition in and of itself doesn't have implications for warrant. So if we compare the situation today understanding evolutionary psychology, where you're saying it does not have a, 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 an absolute disposition one way or another, that though by itself moves it away from where we were 
previously where most theists would believe that God made an affirmative decision to put this in. So now, now you have ambiguity before you had certainty if you're a theist. Well, I'm not sure that's, uh, I'm not sure that's true. And I, here's why. First of all, and this would be a different discussion, but it's not, there are a number of uh, contending theories uh, for how and why we would have innate dispositions. In fact, there isn't even an agreement about whether we have these innate dispositions. So, uh, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, argues that religious belief is a virus that in, mm -hmm. infects us and that uh, it may not be a reflection of how our minds innately work. Right now, I think this is one of the most exciting areas of, uh, of research in evolutionary biology and cognitive science, but in a sense we have a an embarrassment of riches. Uh, there are a variety of theories and not all of them are even uh, mutually consistent. So... Um, That's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, it's a good sign. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new area of research and uh, as with, as is typical in science with new areas of research, the um, theoretical resources are not complete, uh, fully pruned by by data yet. You did your doctorate in evolutionary theory, and you are a believer. So, what's your conclusion? How, what do, where do you see it? Where do where do you see God's role? Because you believe in God, in the process of evolution, knowing all you do about evolutionary psychology. Well, I am. I, I believe that, um, as with gravity and the law of thermodynamics and evolutionary theory, that God created a universe that is regulated by natural law, uh, that the outcomes of this process are not surprising to him, and, and we're here. Uh, <laughs> creatures on Earth uh, exist who have the capacities to, to believe in him. Uh, I don't see a conflict there. Now, the question is, whether um, the fact that we have the capacities to form religious beliefs um, subverts our warrant uh, or for confidence in the truth of those mm -hmm. beliefs. And um, I don't think it does. Why? Because the obsiduation of the dialoctate has trichonomic ligatations. How many? How many? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best explanation yeah. I've heard re recently. Well, I mean, why wouldn't an explanation um, for a disposition to religious beliefs subvert warrant for truth in that belief? Uh, two responses to that. I mean, first of all, superficially at, at face value, um, that's no news uh, to, to most theists. Uh, most theists, at least in the biblical tradition and certainly in the Christian uh, tradition, the writings of Paul, for example, um, b believe that um, we're created with an innate disposition to believe in God. Calvin called it the, the sensus divinitatis. It's not an inerrant, it's not immune to the overlays of, of culture. Um, but the fact that there are innate dispositions toward belief in the supernatural is completely concordant with the view of human nature that most theists uh, have had. Now, some people even take that uh, to be a demonstration uh, and try to do a natural theology based on that. I don't, I don't think that works. But at face value, there's no conflict. Um, there is a deeper question here, though, and the deeper question would be, um, and this would be tr hold true for either religious or moral beliefs, the, the general challenge, and it makes sense at, at face value, is that if we have a causal account of uh, a belief that somebody has that functions whether or not the belief is true, mm -hmm. then um, the belief may be true, but the person holding it doesn't have any warrant or any justification uh, for continuing to hold it. Uh, Richard Joyce talks about a belief bill. He says, imagine somebody took a pill that caused them that to believe that Napoleon lost at Waterloo. Which he did. Which he did. <laughs> uh, so the belief is true, but if the person knows they took that pill, they wouldn't be justified in continuing to believe it. Uh, now, my response to that, and he says that natural selection is a belief pill. Which means that because natural selection exists, which everybody, almost everybody accepts, 
that means that if you believe in God, you do not have warrant or you're not justified. Right. E even if there may be a God, yes. you're not justified because right. of evolution, right. full stop. And, and same with moral beliefs. So, uh, so my response to that, I mean, some people uh, say, well, yeah, but that's, that's true of all beliefs. Uh, na if natural selection is a belief pill, uh, then Al Plantinga, for example, says, uh, then uh, our warrant for believing in the deliverances of reason and science and evolution itself is subverted, unless there's a God who structures <laughs> the natural world. Uh, and that's an interesting argument. I think there's some problems with it. But my response would be twofold. Um, first of all, natural selection is not a belief pill at least in terms of uh, our current proposals, uh, we don't have one currently accepted account of how natural selection causes, uh, in, in this case, not just gen the generic capacity to believe, but specific beliefs, which would be necessary. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there aren't promising proposals, it's that uh, we suffer from an embarrassment of riches. There are a lot of proposals right now. So I want to say, you know, look me up when you get there, first of all. But, but I think that the, uh, the, the challenge is real if, if we get there. Um, secondly, though, e even if we got there, let's say we had a, uh, a selection, a, a account in terms of natural selection that, it, that could explain, um, propose a, in terms of a causal genealogy, specific beliefs in ways that um, were insensitive to the truth of those beliefs. Mm -hmm. And there I would want to say, uh, there, there I'd want to say this, it reminds me of this story where a, a group of atheist scientists challenged God and said, uh, we can create life, no problem, uh, no big deal, uh, out of inert matter. And so they showed up and uh, asked God for some dirt, and you keep your dirt, and God says, well, no, bring your own dirt. And so what I want to say to that is, okay, yes, given the existence of a universe fine-tuned uh, with the necessary preconditions for life, given the fact that life emerges, given the fact that there's an evolutionary trajectory that uh, out of which creatures with minds emerge, um, we might have an explanation for the disposition of belief in God. But we don't have all those other givens mm, yet mm. either to return to the belief pill. Let's say somebody did take the belief pill that caused um, them to believe that Napoleon lost at Waterloo. But there were uh, independent evidence um, that the pill uh, for Napoleon's existence uh, in, in exile, that the contents of the pill uh, contained certain herbs that were only uh, growing uh, at the spot of his exile. Uh, during uh, certain years, they discovered journals of Napoleon. Um, so if there were independent evidence that the pill itself were concocted by Napoleon, well, then there might be warrant. Uh, so even if we have uh, an evolutionary account of the native dispositions toward religious belief, that uh, within the context of that theory doesn't involve the target of belief, God, mm -hmm. in a causal account, um, that in and of itself doesn't uh, demonstrate that um, the system that gave rise uh, to creatures uh, and evolutionary structures that make creatures and, and uh, mental cognitive creatures possible is completely insensitive to causal inputs from God, including the initial conditions.